Hello, everyone. My name is Michel. Thank you very much for joining us today. Today, as you have been able to see a few minutes ago, we are extremely fortunate to be able to listen to Dr. Peter Tass from Stanford Medical School uh, on the topic of vibrotactile fingertip stimulation to ease Parkinson's symptoms. Now, it's a bit of a mouthful, but we have all heard about the Parkinson's vibrating gloves, to call them that way, in the media. And it is an amazing opportunity to hear more about this important new development and to ask questions to Dr. Tass directly. Before we start, I would like to remind everyone that this session is for information and education purposes only, as you know. Frankly, if you're seeking medical advice, diagnosis or treatment, you shouldn't be talking to us, you should talk to a medical professional. Um, there will be time for questions at the end of the presentation, as always. Please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. I'm saying it every time, but everyone, every time there is someone who does it, please do not use the chat for questions, because Mark will basically be telling you, put your questions in the Q&A, so you might do it directly, it would be easier. Uh, so for those of you who don't know us yet, No Silver Bullet is managed by Mark Lander and myself with the aim of sharing Parkinson's expertise. What we really are trying to do is to help you and frankly motivate you to become well-informed journalists in your condition so that you can make the informed choices on how to adapt your lifestyle to slow down disease progression. And for that purpose, we are organizing Zoom sessions like today's with researchers and PD specialists to update you on the latest advances in science and medicine nutrition, exercise, and wellness. As you may know, we post the recordings of our sessions on YouTube and Spotify, and we also post, post short videos on TikTok and Instagram. Those short videos are posted every three days. The ones on YouTube, of course, are once a month, like we do our sessions. The details of all those media uh, are available in the chat at the bottom of your screen. You can also visit our website, which is nosilverbullet4pd.com. So no silver bullet in one word, number four, pd.com. Uh, to get all the information. But let's come back to today's topic and to Dr. Tass, who will be talking to us about vibrotactile fingertip stimulation to ease Parkinson's symptoms. Peter, the stage is yours. Thank you very much. Thanks, Michelle and uh, Mark, for the invit uh, invitation. It's a pleasure for me to, to join you. And does it work? Does the presentation work? Okay. It works, so it works perfectly fine. Okay, perfect. Um, so what, what I'm going to present or what I'm going to explain is um, where all this comes from, where the entire development comes from. Um, it's very much mathematics and, and physics and modeling based, theory based, lots of physiology in it. And it started for deep brain stimulation. So the very goal from the very beginning was to stimulate in a way that neurons unlearn their ability to produce abnormal neural symphony long term in order to stimulate, ultimately provide a treatment where we stimulate only occasionally or regularly for a few hours, but achieve really substantial long lasting effects. And the first step was invasive. This was developed for deep brain stimulation and then further developed and adapted for non-invasive vibrotactile fingertip stimulation. So Parkinson's is characterized from a pathophysiology standpoint by abnormal neural synchrony. Synchrony might sound nice, so to speak, like harmony, everybody doing the same thing. But I mean, imagine, for example, a company where all employees do the exact same thing, it wouldn't work. Different neurons have different information processing jobs, and therefore um, excess, excessive synchrony may impair brain function. And um, that's already known since decades. Um, abnormal activity, or in general, activity is very closely linked to connectivity. Those neurons, if you think, for example, of Hab's principle, neurons talking together, also wired together. So, in other words, there's also there are also characteristic changes of the synaptic connectivity. It's not just the activity itself, but it's also the way neurons are connected that changes as a consequence of Parkinson's disease and it's specifically the lack of dopamine. And what we wanna do is we want to change this. We want not just to suppress or whatever abnormal activity, but we want to change the synaptic connectivity to um, revert, to bring the system, bring the brain back to more physiological mode of function. Let me illustrate high frequency deep brain stimulation for those of you who haven't seen this before. So this is a 48 years old patient, right-handed and right-sided. So the right side was the dominant side and this was a test to illustrate the, um, his impairment. 
the patient received um, VIM stimulation, so the electrode was implanted in the VIM, the thalamic ventral, ventral intermediate nucleus of the thalamus. So here's the electrode, here's the cable, and here's the generator. Not all ben patients benefit like this, but he had a huge benefit. And you see, and this is the main message, uh, this means stimulation of it's German. You, you see, and that's the main message, message. There are no long lasting effects. We turn off stimulation, and in, in particular with the thalamic target, um, there's a so called rebound. And when um, this came from Benabi in Grenoble, um, developed this in the 90s for Parkinson's disease, and then, and then it came to Germany, and I got intrigued by it, and then developed something novel and the point why the motivation why um, um on, on, it's it's definitely a breakthrough so standard deep brain simulation is a huge breakthrough and so helpful for so many parkinson patients so please don't get me wrong but it has limitations on the one hand it's a very so to speak unphysiological type of stimulation it's a permanent a chronic 100 uh, or greater than 100 hertz stimulation, often 130 hertz um, stimulation, which doesn't have long lasting therapeutic effect. So if you turn up, symptoms revert back with, uh, within seconds to minutes, for example, tremor, or within minutes to half an hour, like um, rigidity, akinesia. And it may have relevant side effects. It's even in the meantime, a, a term that's called DBS induced movement disorders, depending on the target area where you stimulate you induce different groups of symptoms and there are many reasons for it and one problematic or really limiting factor is if you have a target area the target area is not homo homogeneous it consists of different anatomical structures some of which you want you have to stimulate others you have to spare but this is difficult and uh, for example unwanted but inevitable stimulation of, for example, specific target and fiber tracts causes side effects, for example, speech issues. And that's the point. So um, it does not really help uh, with speech and other so-called actual symptoms, um, gait, um, balance. So there are clinical limitations. And the, the approach I'm talking about today is, is computationally based. The very fundamental point was to um, specifically counteract abnormal neuronal synchronization by desynchronization. You can do all sorts of things with strongly synchronized neurons. You can suppress them, you can inhibit them, you can, so to speak, shut them down, stop them. What we want to do is a very minimal type of a very non-aggressive, mild type of intervention when it desynchronized them. So they can go on, they're firing, but, never, but not in a synchronized way. And the important point was and that follow, was following from very thorough, these are just two citations, but we have tons of papers who show this. The important point is that these neurons are plastic. In other words, as I mentioned at the beginning, the synaptic strength gets adapted to the activity of the neurons. And even the simplest neural networks, even two or three, already two or three neurons and plastic synapses may be in qualitatively very different states. And for example, these group of neurons, the neurons are symbolized by these balls. They can be strongly connected and then produce highly synchronized activities. So what you see here, the x-axis is the time axis, the y-axis is the neural index, and you see that they are, nearly all of them are firing at the same time. So very regular, very strong firing, everybody talking strongly uh, to each other by these strong synapses. However, these, this group of neurons can, can also be loosely connected or physiologically connected so that everybody does so to speak, its own jobs, not, not everybody is firing in the same, at the same time. And that's what you see here. So this is a desynchronized firing. And that's the goal. We want to train these networks that they unlearn their abnormal connectivities so that their connectivities get 
synaptic connections get weaker so that they unlearn their abnormal synchrony and get into a more desynchronized, more healthy type of firing. And this can be visualized by means of such potential landscapes you might know from physics, from chemistry, where you have an attractor state for the pathologic corresponding to the one attractor corresponding to the pathological situation, strongly synchronized, strongly connected, and the more healthy model state more weakly connected and desynchronized. And desynchronization, still desynchronizing stimulation aims at moving, shifting the system to a more healthy attractor. Coordinated, we've, we've developed a number of stimulation techniques that in principle serve this um, purpose. Coordinated reset is particularly robust for clinical applications. Coordinated reset means schematically the following. So we have a bunch of neurons. These gray balls represent these neurons. And what we do is we stim don't stimulate at one specific point with a very high, if you compare it to standard deep brain stimulation, with a rather high amplitude just below side effect threshold. But what we do is we stimulate at different sites at different times in a weak way. And weak means we don't block these neurons. They have to continue to fire because only active neurons learn or unlearn and in a general change their synaptic connectivity patterns. And that's the goal. So we must not block them. And uh, what we therefore do is we cause a phase, what's called a phase reset of these different subpopulations at different times. And phase reset simply means that you restart the rhythm. So prior to the stimulation, all the neurons are in synchrony and after the stimulation, these different, they have phase differences, they're out of sync, these different subpopulations. And, um, and the pattern, sorry, and the pattern that is used is, for example, for deep brain stimulation, let's for a while um, and focus on deep brain stimulation, where all this came from, is, is as follows. So we don't have a permanent pulse train, but we have these brief, very mild bursts that um, this is, um, so to speak, a periodic backbone. There's a clock ticking in this pattern, so to speak. It corresponds to, for example, characteristic, physiological characteristic like the dominant frequency of the rhythm. And there's some um, randomness to, so these sequences are randomized. And I show you that how this looks like in monkeys, Parkinsonian monkeys. So this is 16 fold velocity. These are seconds. That's a measurement cage. All the monkeys were in for 90 seconds a day. And you see this, and they were treated with MPTP, which is a toxic neurotoxic substance that selectively destroys dopamine producing cells. And the monkeys, after this MPTP treatment and only have between eight, uh, sorry, five and 10% of dopamine producing cells left. So that's, that's a huge loss, corresponds to very, very late stage Parkinson's. You see how akinetic, these are 10 minutes, um, uh, how akinetic the, the monkey is hardly moves. And this little head is a, is a um, uh, was used in order to protect the electrode from being pulled out by the monkeys. We stimulated these, the monkeys, these macaques are, are little, little nice animals. We couldn't implant human IPGs, they're way too large. Therefore, they were only stimulated two hours a day on five consecutive days. And it was a crossover study comparing standard deep brain stimulation. And this, this is the same monkey, and the monkeys didn't get any medication, no dopa, nothing. And this is the same monkey after two hours of coordinated reset deep brain stimulation delivered to the SDN, the standard target for deep brain stimulation. Again, 16 fold velocity to show you a representative 10 minutes time window. And you see that there's no difference from, compared to a normal monkey with respect to movement production. The movement production was measured in this measurement case cage by means of a light barrier system.
And the very encouraging finding was, although the parameters was, were not optimized at that time, simulation parameters were not optimized at that time, was that uh, the effects, if, if it, when we simulated monkeys five days in a row, two hours a day, so in total only 10 hours, no 24 seven type of simulation, only 10 hours, the effects lasted for a month pronounced effects less than four months. There's a number of studies where this was shown independently by, by other groups. We've also shown this um, in a proof of concept in externalized, so-called externalized Parkinson patients. It's a standard procedure in neurosurgery, so you implant electrodes, but not yet the cable and the, the IPG, the implantable pulse generator. Instead, we stimulated um, through a portable external stimulator, because at that time, the IPGs weren't able to deliver coordinated reset stimulation. And we recorded um, the, uh, the changes of symptoms, as well as the, the brain activity in the depth in the target area um, during three days. This is, this is typically an example of the, uh, of the patient. The patient was off medication in the video, in the second video, uh, second part of the video after uh, when stimulated. So this patient is a 49 years old patient. She also suffered from a um, dystonia for more than a year. She wasn't able to stretch her fingers and use her hand. This is post-operative. So three days after electrode implantation, you see the full-blown symptoms, the tremor, um, also the dystonia, and we recorded all sorts of signals, mus muscular activity, accelerometer, and so on. An important point is now, this is about 20 minutes after turning on stimulation, so the symptoms were gone, and remarkably also dystonia, because dystonia does not resp respond well or quickly to, in particular, to STN stimulation. So this is unilateral STN stimulation, and this is the important point now. This is one hour after turning off stimulation. And you see that the symptoms do not come back. It's clinically, from a clinical perspective, very, very different compared to um, standard deep brain stimulation. And also from an electrophysiological standpoint, it was very, diff very different. So what we, what we did is we recorded from the depth electrodes that you used from exactly the same contacts, simulation contacts, um, we use these stimulation contacts for recording before and after, so in the morning and in the evening. In, in the and for example, this is the exact same patient you've just seen. And as I said, she's off medication, was off medication for the entire procedure. And this is the the x-axis and this is the spectral energy so the amount of um, uh, of rhythm physiological or abnormal rhythm that's part of the signal and you see this pronounced about five hertz tremor related peak and then the akinesian rigidity related so called beta band peak before stimulation and this is now one hour after turning off stimulation and you see these peaks are gone one hour still uh, one hour after turning off. And that's very different compared to standard deep brain, clinically effective deep brain stimulation. This peak returns within 12 seconds. And now the point is um, patients, of course, and understandably prefer a non invasive stimulation as opposed to an invasive stimulation. That's one thing. The other thing is the non invasive stimulation uses anatomically well-defined pathways so that we can actually reach specific targets um, in the brain without stimulation without stimulating for example fiber band bundles in the in the vicinity and that's a huge advantage based on again the computational studies the prediction was we can do we should be able to do this also non-invasively simply because we do not want to suppress neurons. We want, don't want to abnormally increase or decrease their firing. So for example, cause a massive inhibition. But we would, what we want to do is 
if these are the neurons, assume this is, these are the neurons that are in synchrony, what we want to do is we want to um, determine or modulate the firing patterns, in other words, so that specific parts of the of the neural population fire at different times. We need a control over the, the timing of the neural discharges. That's the goal of this approach. And this is possible. And why is it possible? Because of the number of studies, because a number of really brilliant studies by um, Rice and co-workers. It was shown, it's Lenz's lab. Um, the following was shown. So what they did was in human um, subjects, same data available from uh, in monkey studies, from monkey studies, but in human study, in humans, intraoperatively, they recorded from depth electrodes from different targets, and specifically from the so called thalamic somatic sensory nucleus, which is the primary input, input hub for proprioceptive information, for example, for touch information, for vibration and other touch sensation types. And what they did was to characterize the response properties of these neurons and to also delineate it from other, um, other targets. They performed vibrations in different parts, for example, in the hand phase, wherever. And what they found is that, um, and then they found that these neurons their firing is controlled by the vibration. And what you see here is a so-called cycle histogram. So this is one cycle of the vibration. So this is the peripheral vibration signal. This is from zero to 260. This is one cycle. And they and the y-axis is the histogram. So they just counted when did this neuron that they are recording in the depth of the in the depth of the brain, a patient's brain discharge at which phase of the vibration, peripheral vibration cycle. Now let's assume, for example, there, were, there, were, there was no um, relationship between the vibration and the discharges. What we had to, uh, what we would be expect is a flat line, more or less flat line, noisy flat line. But what they've seen, what they found is this beautiful phase, what's called phase locking. So we have a pronounced peak so in other words, the neuron that recorded here is just one example out of many, had a preferred phase relationship. And that's the important point. So this is real, uh, this is a very fundamental type of uh, experiment that's been done in Parkinson patients and essential trauma patients, patients with chronic stroke um, and, and uh, dystonia. And now, where do we want to vibrate? We selected the fingertips simply because the fingertips are small, only a small portion of the entire skin surface, but it's strategically favorable simply because of the massive over representation of the cortical representation. So what you see here is the sensory cortex, the neurons that are activated and process information when, for example, the little, the ring, the middle, the index, and the thumb get activated. And um, according to this um, uh, over-representation, um, uh, you see the corresponding so-called homunculus. So there are huge areas, huge areas that are, there, that, that, are, that are represented by the brain, in particular the fingertips. And in our first generation type of still clunky, but was a big step forward. Um, glove device, we had vibrators for each finger, except for the thumbs and on both hands. And the stimulation pattern is the exact same, basically the exact same um, as for deep brain stimulation. The only difference was that we replaced the electrical bursts delivered through stimulation contacts by vibratory bursts delivered through the fingertips. Now, let me show you a couple of data and then videos in order to, um, because um, numbers, so that you understand what the numbers mean. So all of the the, the MDS UPDRS part three, MDS UPDRS part three mm, are the motor scores, the standard motor scores. And all of these motor scores were <clears throat> taken, these exams were performed after 
thorough med uh, medication withdrawal. So the patient came in, patients came in in the morning at eight o'clock after really proper medication withdrawal, depending on the half-life of the medication between 12 hours up to 48 hours. And we tested on one visit day, we tested the so-called what we call the acute effects of all the tactile of this type of glove treatment. So the patients came in, these were unfortunately only six patients simply because of COVID. At that time, we wanted to have 10 or um, if, if possible, uh, 20 patients, but uh, due to COVID had to stop this, this study after three months. And um, patients came in in the morning and had an off medication score then in between, they, they didn't receive any DOPA. They remained off medication. So normally, if you're already off for quite a while, don't receive treatment, you typically get worse. But and but what they received in the meantime were two times two hours with the glove treatment and the patients significantly improved as a group. Show you the single patients on the next slide. What we then also looked for is the cumulative effects over three months. So the patients came in at eight o'clock in the morning on another visit day, off medication, after medication withdrawal. Then they received glove treatment for two to four hours a day um, during three months. And they came in after three months and they had a significant improvement. So their, their situation, they were off medication. They had an off medication withdrawal but nevertheless, they were significantly improved. Now the question is, is this only a statistical, statistical improvement or is it also a clinical improvement? For this, there's the concept of so-called MCID, minimally clinically identifiable difference. So in other words, when the, these are the patients, patient one to patient six. So when um, the, the decrease of the motor scores goes beyond 3.25, then this is clinically significant. There's an improvement where the patients really say, well, I really feel better. And these are the acute effects on the first day. So coming in in the morning, being off medication, not receiving any medication, just two times two hours, glove treatment, and then measuring again in the afternoon at 3.30 p.m. And you see that all but one patient had a significant improvement. This patient at least did not get worse, although not receiving any medication. And the, the long lasting three month effects are shown in the orange. So in the orange bars, you see that all patients passed these, uh, the MCID. So all of them had a clinically significant improvement. Patients also had a um, strong reduction of, of the medication. That's something we found in practically all of our patients. We did not instruct our patients to reduce their meds, but some of them suffered from uh, relevant side effects. And for those patients, it was a great relief to be able to reduce the medications. There was one finding I did not expect, because, uh, and that was that referred to the EG. We've seen a very pronounced effect cortically. Because what you, the, the abnormal rhythms that are typical for Parkinson's, so the trauma related, for example, theta rhythm, and the cortical, um, cortical uh, and the and the sorry and the rigidity in the kinesia related beta band, they are, they can be uh, seen even by by visual inspection from recordings and the depth from lo so called local field potentials. However, on the cortical level with an EEG recordings, it's way more difficult. Nevertheless, we found very pronounced effects in these, even in this small cohort of patients. What we did was simply because we, we only had these um, small sample, um, small number of patients, we focused on the sensory motor cortex. And we tested, are there any, uh, and, and again, this is off medication. So patients were um, in both situations before treatment and after three months of glove treatment, they were off medication. And we tested, um, we asked, are there any differences in the power, the amount uh, of the signal 
so to speak, the amplitude, in other words, the synchronization in these in, in the frequency bands. And the, the, the only frequency band I've seen a significant difference was the high beta band between 21 and 30 hertz. As you can see here, already by visual inspection, it's a huge difference. Of course, it was definitely significant. This is before stimulation in the off medication state, and this is after three months of glove treatment love stimulation in the off medication state you see a huge um, and that's a group uh, group analysis so all data pooled on the on, uh, the and um, Montreal Neurological Institute reference for the brain and we did case series studies in addition case series studies uh, in order to to understand what are the time courses of the responses how quickly do they build up and um, because it's very different com compared to, for example, standard deep brain stimulation, the glove treatment builds up a bit more slowly, but then you have, you have these pronounced long lasting effects. And again, all of these data points are MDSU PDRS part three, meaning motor scores, off medication. So properly, uh, um, taken up after proper medication withdrawal. And so the, the y-axis are the motor scores, the x-axis are the days of vital tactile CR stimulation. In between these visits, of course, patients took their medication, but for these visit days, they, were, they had a medication withdrawal. And you see how nicely and massively these um, <clears throat> motor scores decreased. And for example, this patient who had the initially plan protocol that we couldn't follow due to COVID. So it was half a year, two to four hours a day, one month pre-plan um, pause. So no, no deterioration, no increase of the symptoms. <clears throat> and then again, six months, but with, a, with only maintenance dose. So one to two times, uh, two, hour, uh, two hours a week only, and still a further beautiful linear improvement. We were able to follow up three patients like this, and they received the six months, one month pre plan pause, six month maintenance dose, and they had after effects, meaning a massively reduced MDSU PDRS part three motor score, and uh, strongly reduced medication for between one and one and a half years. Now, let me show you some videos at, uh, finally in order to illustrate these effects. So this is a patient who was diagnosed in 2007. He came to us in 2018. He took quite, quite a lot of medication. So every half hour or so he had to take medication simply because otherwise he, 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 he was able to move. He was, he was so uh, rigid and akinetic. It was about 50% in an off time every day and basically lying in bed because he couldn't, couldn't move. He used a cane and was told to, to use a wheelchair because it was at that time falling more and more often. And this is the patient now on medication, close to his best on. It's not a medication withdrawal, so he's close, close to his best on. And you see these um, typical, unfortunately you're familiar with this, um, little steps, the arms are not swinging, There's, there are no facial expressions. And the instruction was simply to enter the room, please close the door. And it goes on like this. And this, and then the patient came to us, it was August 20, 2018, and told him to use as much meds as, as, as necessary. There was, in order to feel as, 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 as well as possible. Um, so there was no instruction to reduce medication. However, he reduced the medication from day one on to, he went down to six. So this was his level during the first one, one and a half years, six to seven, covered over, lived over, and then he further decreased it. And this is the patient then after two times, two hours, glove stimulation. See the nice steps, large steps, swinging arms, facial expressions, 
patient then went went home and is um, um, after this was the sixth day he was at home he was stimulating two hours a day. He started was able to start working again. And we were surprised also because all of our patients who had pronounced impairment, we, we were surprised because we've also seen non-motor symptoms. Parkinson's is not just a motor disorder. It's, a, it's characterized by motor impairment, sensory impairment, impairment of sensory motor integration, but also other non-motor symptoms like, for example, olfactory impairment or vision impairment, and our patients reported an improvement of olfaction, improvement of vision. And for example, we had this patient was was cooking for his company, uh, for his, sorry, for his family and on the weekends was, was no, in the past, pre Parkinson's, was no longer able to do this simply because he wasn't able to smell and, and taste what he was doing. And his sense of smell and taste came back by about, um, well, it's always subjective and perceptual measures, 85%. And so he was able to cook again. And finally, in November 2018, he was he wasn't a runner or so before, but then got into this running. And then in November 2018, was running a marathon in 2020, what was it? In 2022, then his first triathlon, and he's really doing great. And um, fortunately, we were able to follow up a couple of patients for, for several years, for one more years. This is another example of a Parkinson patients and early onset patients diagnosed at the age of 27, again off meds in the morning prior to treatment. And he did lots of workout with the, with the hope to sort of counteract the progression or counteract the disease or improve his condition, but was no longer able to do this simply because the tremor, and, um, tremor on the right side and also balance issues, as you can see here now, that's the pull test you're probably familiar with. Um, balance issues made it impossible for him. He was scheduled at that time, and uh, this was July 2019, he was scheduled for um, DBS in September 2019, but since, never, since then, it was never implanted. This is the video he sent me after six weeks of tactile glove treatment. And this is another patient, uh, and I will show you how um, one important thing with that version of the of the treatment, it was the first generation. Um, we had very encouraging results in all of our patients. But one important there's one important point, it's very different compared to deep brain stimulation. It's not an on-off type of thing where you turn on the stimulation and you immediately suppress for some tremor. So but it builds up. This is um, patient years in um, off medication. It's the first visit day, first day in the morning morning prior to uh, glove treatment, he simply asked to move out of the out of the room and then walk along the hallway. His dominant sim symptom was um, shuffling, so the fascination was also on medication. Was, it was um, a huge burden for him. And we, we provoked the standard to provoke it by asking patients to turn around in narrow hallways, as you can see now. So that's when the shuffling kicks in very strongly. And sometimes it was really hardly possible for the patient to, to um, get into a normal mode of gait mode. And then, and then this is now, and this is the important point, this is now after three months, again off medication, in the morning, no medication. And you see the patient is already um, significantly improved. And he told us that with medication, shuffling was hardly, was practically no problem anymore. But you still see, and that's why we do this off medication, 
because you, you still see that the arm not, the right the, the right arm's not swinging. He still shuffles a bit when he has to turn around. So it takes time. It's not just it's we use plasticity mechanisms. That's one thing. And learning principles. And you also don't learn learn, for example, to play an instrument within a within an afternoon. So from the very beginning, these, these effects grow on a slower time scale. And it was also the first version of the of this type of device. And this is now after five months of treatment. And then after six months, I hope it's not too loud. I can't control the loud. Uh, I can't control the loudness here. <laughs> um, this is after six months and a pre planned one month pause. So, and what we are currently doing is we're in the middle of finishing, um, we're about to finish within, oh, um, oh, in, in summer we'll have a new stimulation device finished, which really does what, what coordinated reset is meant to be. And this, the, the device we've used so far is, is a prototype. It will be better with a couple of different aspects from a couple of different aspects since we are still filing ip it's um not, not able to disclose anything at the moment i mean it's if you if you compare it to the situation of car racing we'll have a car that is really fantastic you know the simple elements single elements much better engine and all this and and um, i'm super eager and really looking forward to drive it this summer and we'll start with a with a series of of, of studies We'll, we'll have a um, really personalized way how to calibrate stimulation because not only the brain circuits are impaired in Parkinson's, for example, the, the input, touch input is also more coarse grained in Parkinson's. That's known Parkinson's patients and then sometimes have, for example, difficulties selling what kind of coins they have in their pockets. And after, for example, three months of that glove treatment, they were able to do this. But also the, the skin thickness varies. It depends on whether you're a smoker or not, on age, uh, sex, and whatever. There are many different different um, aspects. So as I said, we'll have we'll have this device ready for clinical testing, and then we'll do a nice and very thorough, apart from specific tests, specific studies where we look at specific processes and effects of the glove. We'll also do a very, a very nice controlled study and then plan to ramp this up in a very fundamental way. We have now the funding that's required uh, if the, the partners, also engineering wise, the partners, first rate partners to do this also very quickly. And I'm very grateful for the massive support and help. Thank you very much. Peter, thank you. Thank you in particular for sharing all this information with us. We already have quite a few questions waiting for us in the Q&A section. I just would like to say to the participants that actually based on past experience, we probably are at capacity in terms of questions. So I would just recommend perhaps to wait a bit and see whether your question comes up already being asked by someone else. But please don't pile up too much because we are probably at the maximum number we can respond to. Let's just get started, Peter. If you don't mind, maybe stopping sharing your screen so we can see you again. Absolutely, absolutely. That's where you can. Thank you very much. So Stella has a few questions. Let's just get started. Um, she's basically asking whether there is a specific stimulation pattern to be used uh, for the gloves, and does it mean that all brains respond equally well to the stimulation? So is it standardized across human beings? Well, it's a specific pattern. Um, it's a pattern that's designed in order to disrupt abnormal neuronal synchrony. We've been working on, on this type of stimulation for a very, very uh, long, um, long period of time. And of course, not 
everybody will respond in different ways, for example, and that's what you've also seen. And also, if you, for example, remember the acute, the, the diagram or the figure with the acute and, and, and long-term effects, some patients respond very quickly. Some, in some patients, it, it takes a bit more longer. And there, we have very clear hypothesis why and what we have to do in order to optimize it. And for example, also with respect to the calibration, so far it was a, a one size fits all type of stimulation. We'll have in summer, we'll have the ability to really personalize the treatment based on characteristics, not only neuronal characteristics, also skin characteristics of the subjects. Every, every patient is, an, is, a, is, a, is a unique human being and as such that treatment has to be personalized, of course. That's amazing. Yeah, so the progress will be far more personalized as, as the new models are coming out. Um, another question is about the effect of the, 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 the therapy on alpha synuclein aggregation. Um, does it keep building up or does the desynchronization have an impact on alpha synuclein clumps? Yeah, it's a, it's a perfect uh, question. We have not yet tested it. We will do mechanism of action, what we call mechanism of action studies. Where we um, where we'll address um, changes of, for example, dopamine changes of structural plasticity. The important point is what we've observed is surprisingly observed, and that we, therefore we didn't record it, or that we didn't systematically examine it. Was, for example, just as an example, was an improvement of olfaction, also other non improvements, also other non motor symptoms. And the question now is, how is this possible? Because Parkinson's is a, um, a multi-systems degeneration type of disorder, and the olfactory bulb is one of the first brain areas that's involved in the degeneration. What is known from animal experiments is that there's a tight interaction between activity on the one side and also degenerative processes. Also, re also related to synuclein, but also related to, for example, cell death. So, and the other thing is, there are also studies that show not all neurons need to be just either producing dopa or otherwise being dead, but there can also be, there's a spectrum, for example, neurons can also be non-dead and produce, uh, instead of dopamine, produce um, molecules that induce inflammation. And there's one study that showed the following. In rats, in a disease model of rats that were stimulated with standard deep brain stimulation, very very early stages, the the deterioration and the progression of the dis, uh, of the degeneration was stopped, was reverted. Mm -hmm. But you can't treat, uh, you can't use deep brain stimulation in the early stages for Parkinson patients. It wouldn't be a feasible treatment, simply because of the the risk of a bleeding. It's a surgical treatment. And this is our hope and our goal long term to provide. Of course, we we do we we focus on really at least moderately effective Parkinson patients simply because then we have a large effect size. And hence we need fewer patients so that we can proceed more quickly to because the ultimate goal is to bring it to the market, bring to all patients as soon as possible. But the, the, other, the other really important goal is to bring it to, to provide patients, Parkinson patients with the treatment from early on that really slows down the progression. And we'll, we'll work hev uh, heavily on, we're working heavily on this. That leads me to, the, to a question that was put to me uh, outside of this chat, which was basically, does it apply to all stages of Parkinson's from I think one to five? Well, we have, we have, we don't have um, tested in, we, we haven't tested it in hundreds of patients, therefore we have to be careful. I mean, I don't want to yes. overclaim or so, that's clear. But based on the, on our experiences now, yes, we've seen, we've seen effects in all, in, in really only mildly affected patients, but also in really late stage patients. That's amazing. Now, building again on what you just mentioned a second ago about your desire to bring it to market, uh, you have an audience here of 165 people listening to you live who are basically all have the same question. What is the timeline for availability to the public? It's, it's difficult to tell because it, um, it, it really depends on, for example, in, in, 
very specifically just one important aspect, as I told you about the racing car. We, we expect this car to be very fast and really super compared to the previous one, but we have to know exactly how much faster it is. And this will influence the FDA approval trial we're going to do. This will influence the time points of the, of the um, outcome, per, uh, outcome measures. And I hope that in, let's say, one and a half or two years or so, we'll have um, this product available. That's amazing because we very often hear products that will be available in five years and it is a forever five year cycle. So to hear a shorter deadline is a, is a real progress. Um, again, the same question, which is basically more like shooting from the hip from many people asking if they wanted to take part to the next session, the next trials, how should they apply? Is it probably too early or how should they be in touch with no, your lab? We, what, we, what we have done is, uh, and what we have done, well, we, we, we received some media attention and then many patients contacted us. And we have, a, we have an email address, Parkinson's VCR at stanford.edu. And then for us, it was a difficult thing because we weren't, although I have one person, one brave person who, who really tries to cope with all this, apart from her lab's work, um, but it's not so trivial to discuss medical matters by email. So in other words, we had to have, and unfortunately we now have it since the month or so, or five weeks or so, or six weeks, I don't remember. We have a, an IRB ethics committee approved electronic questionnaire. Mm -hmm. So it's a red cap link, it's super secure, it fulfills all patient information security um, requirements. Stanford is very strict about this and that's good. And, um, and so patients can enter their data if they want to participate. And if they qualify, for example, for, for the next study, they, um, or even if they're not qualifying for one of the next studies, they might qualify for a future study, but we will reach out. So if you want, if you're interested in participating in one of our studies, but currently, unfortunately, we only, uh, include enrolled patients um, living in the US. Just go to my website and there you find this red cap link. It's on the first page and then fill out the, the electronic screening questionnaire and then Thank we'll reach out to you. That's great. It's good to get that out of the way. Let's get back to asking more stimulating questions such as uh, a question from an anonymous attendee who basically says that there are many do-it-yourself DIY designs on the internet. And I'm aware of some forums where people have been trying to build their own gloves. Um, do you have any opinions on those uh, models that, of course, don't necessarily benefit from your know-how or your science? Yeah, well, um, to be perfectly honest, sometimes, I mean, some, some patients also reach out and show us their, their do-it-yourself devices. And some of these devices might be really clever or well-made or whatever, but I can't test them. Um, uh, and some some look really scary and, and use electricity instead of vibrations. So it's it's a very concerning thing. So I would really discourage patients from doing. I understand the need for treatment. I really understand it. Believe me, but I would really discourage patients from doing it themselves. Because we've been spent we spent really many years on doing this, optimizing this. We have now six different engineer teams on working on different aspects of the glove. So uh, I think yeah. patients would be better. I think it's very fair. So it was a very big hurdle requiring an amazing amount of resources that few people will have. Um, Robert uh, is basically saying that he has only PD tremors in his left hand and arm. Uh, would someone like him need to do to use one glove only or would it be both hands? Well, what I would expect is that one glove would be sufficient simply because um, we know that desynchronizing, mm -hmm. the desynchronizing effects of coordinated reset propagate. Uh, for example, in the presentation, if you, if you remember the, the, the lady that received coordinated reset deep brain stimulation, all of these patients were unilaterally stimulated, but nevertheless had full blown bilateral effects. Thank you very much. The question that comes a lot is basically, uh, does the type of activity of the person wearing the gloves have an impact on their effectiveness? I had questions about sleeping, about where do you, should you put your hands? Can you be walking? Does it, does it have an impact? Yeah, it's a very good question and very important question. So what, what our patients did was they were wearing it 
they did uh, they um we allowed or, or we we accepted uh, or told them to do every day some everyday activities like reading watching tv walking some even used it for workout for jogging and um we didn't we didn't encourage patients to use it at night and this is simply because this adds to the complexity of studies not because we do not believe that it doesn't work but it adds to the complexity of studies because the different sleep stages and in different sleep stages the brain activity is different and the glove effect might be might differ from one stage to the other that's the point thank you very much uh, i have a question here about uh uh harry asking whether you see your treatment as being an alternative to dps so could you repeat? would you see your 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 therapy your treatment as being an alternative to deep brain surgery well the, the most important point is not um that it that i would not start considering as a as a as a competition with deep brain stimulation the effect size is huge this is a real competitor based on what we've seen so far um, there might also be interactions, for example, one might also offer patients with deep brain stimulation that do not respond uh, with respect to the actual symptoms, um, the glove for, for a relief of these symptoms. I would not, we are not yet at a point where we could make such a statement. Thank you. A question that comes back again from various angles is what sequence of vibrations do you consider the best? Someone mentions multiple studies or different type of sequences, uh, like uh, I don't, I'm not familiar with those sequences, but I'm sure you are regular coordinated reset, jitter coordinated reset, variable stimulus amplitude coordinated reset. Those are probably very familiar to you. Um, yeah. Is there, do you have a view as to which ones are more effective? Well, what we, what we will do is um, we will um, test a number also of novel um, stimulus sequences. Also, there's one fundamentally new aspect and feature I cannot yet disclose simply because of patent um, uh, constraints by Stanford. So this has to be first uh, thoroughly patented and then I can talk about this, um, which should make also from a stimulation pattern aspect, the entire stimulation way more effective. Mm -hmm. An interesting question, actually, at least to me, is uh, does the treatment restart the production of dopamine? That's a good question. That's a very good question. So because what we see, <clears throat> what we see is that it replaces to some extent dopamine. So in other words, patients do not do, do not need or uh, do need less dopa. And in the few patients with levodopa-induced um, dyskinesias, what we've seen is that um, it, it works really well in these patients. Fortunately, it's the only the only symptom where we have to take really take into account the interaction between glove and medication. For example, if you if we start with this, with full blown four hours during the first few weeks, uh, in total four hours daily gloves uh, treatment. And don't reduce medication, dyskinesia increases. So there are two ways. Either you start with two hour stimulation, so you slowly ramp it up, or you from the very beginning decrease the medication. And what we've seen, for example, in, in one of the patients who had a severe, really severe um, LID, levodopa induced dyskinesia, he um, basically had hardly any dyskinesias anymore, but he was playing around with the with the with the glove a bit um, in a way that I would never have gotten acceptance or clearance from the IRB, but you learn a lot from patients, I can tell you. And what he, for example, observed is when he overstimulated, stimulated too much, dyskinesia came back. So there's some sort of whatever functional equivalence of dopa or whatever with the glove treatment. This is something you're gonna study carefully, but I can't explain it in more details. And this is, for example, why this patient then after two, three years was only stimulating one or two hours per week, but doing really well. 
understood. Another topic that comes back across uh, several questions is non-motor symptoms. For instance, uh, someone was asking, um, do the gloves help in treating PD dementia? But uh, if you could just maybe comment on non-motor symptoms in general. Yeah, well, concerning PD dementia, we had two patients. I don't want to make any claim today. N not at all. Um, because dementia is um, the, the cognitive impairment is a way broader and diverse spectrum compared to the motor symptom spectrum in Parkinson's disease. And what we've observed is that in two patients with cognitive impairment, a massive improvement of, of their cognitive abilities. But this is a very, very early and non-representative observation. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um... Yes, I think I'm just going to the questions. I'm just going scrolling. The good news about we have ton, tons of questions today, but they tend to be coalescing around the same topics. Um, yes, same topics again. Yes, how will the gloves be distributed to the people with Parkinson? I think it's a bit premature for that. Yes, one question that was interesting is basically, um, if I saw right, I don't think there was uh, the, glo the, the the thumb was being used for uh, stimulation. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about this? Why was that finger excluded from the glove? Well, it was on the one hand, it was a technical limitation. We only had for the first model we had an eight-channel amplifier. That's very very simple, okay. um, and therefore two two times four fingers. But the other thing is, it's way easier for patients to be able to do at least a bit with their thumbs and in future in future studies we'll um we'll explore in detail also how how many fingers we actually need and if, whether we need bilateral stimulation because we also stimulate patients unilaterally in the ad full blown effects mm -hmm. on that same topic actually someone was asking whether the glove for one hand is the mirror of the glove for the other hand are they in a sense mirror of each other that, that's a very good question, and we have been working on this in detail, and there's one patent pending, and therefore I cannot answer this question, but there are, there are some principles that, that are very, very relevant, but I think in autumn I can talk openly about this. Sorry. Thank you very much. No, we will keep the question for later. Uh, a topic that comes up as well is basically uh, how long you, 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 you would need to be using the glove. Would it be a lifelong experience once you get started, although probably spaced out? It may not be a daily exercise, but would it be for the rest of our lives? Yeah, well, what we 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 only have, as I said, we don't have uh, experience in hundreds of patients or so so far. That are, therefore can cannot make it, so to speak, definite um, statement. Um, but the patients, who, one patient, for example, just an example, who who received the treatment for about uh, four and a half years, he, he stimulated two to four hours a day for the first one or one and a half years and then continuously decreased and then stimulated between one and two hour times two hours a week. So just a maintenance dose. That is really not onerous at all compared to the benefits that we see in the, the video that you've shown us. Um, now, can we just zoom in a tiny bit on the, on the studies? Because the study that you mentioned uh, was a very small sample due to COVID. And I guess the next couple of years or three years will be used to probably, of course, release the new version of the gloves, but maybe expand the size of the of the sample. Can you talk to us a tiny bit about that? And in particular, yeah. for the for the skeptics yeah. that that would be talking about the fact that it is not a non non controlled sample, etc. Whether yeah. it will be of the the, the most rigorous. Uh, scientific. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, from, from Parkinson's Parkinson's. Um, in Parkinson's studies, one has to be aware of a placebo effect because there's a huge, but can be a huge placebo effect. What we, <clears throat> what we, why we don't believe that these effects are placebo effects is simply because placebo effects are not typically not that long lasting, mm -hmm. not that coherent. So there, there are studies showing, for example, more varying types of improvement uh, caused by placebo. But in our in our studies, patients got better and better and better when um, when studied off medication. Another thing is that tremor is not so responsive with, with respect to placebo effects, but we had blown effects on on trauma subscores in all our patients uh, in, in the case reports as well, case series studies, but also in the pilots. 
But nevertheless, it's a very important point, and we are aware of this. And of course, there was COVID and 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 the the um, the delay that was caused caused by COVID. So what we are going to do is. We have a very clear strategy, study, clinical strategy. On the one hand, we'll do um, two, pi two pilot studies for specific purposes related to the new glove. And then we'll have a control study, but then also very soon a multi-center, really very large study. And in, in addition, we'll also have controlled mechanism of action studies where we really look at dopamine production with, mm -hmm. with imaging techniques and so on. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to focus a tiny bit on the desynchronization process itself. And, and there are two questions that have been coming through about that. One is basically understanding better what is triggering the desynchronization. And the second one is it, where does it happen causally? I mean, is it at the subcortical level? And if so, how does the fingertip signal actually get there? Well, it's it's both subcortical but also cortical. So from from in humans, it's known as I've shown you that um, the vibration triggers discharges at particular phases of the vibration cycle. Mm -hmm. And if now assume, for example, all of these neurons in the thalamus are synchro synchronized, but then you have the vibration at different times, at different fingers, then you activate the neurons at different times. So from the very beginning, they cannot, you just you disrupt synchrony because they can no longer be synchronously active because they get activated from the periphery at different times and in different phases. That's one thing. It's also known, for example, from, from animals, animal studies that you, when it does not only have this entrainment phenomenon, this very precise type of control on the thalamic level, but also on the cortical level, on the sensory motor cortical level. So in other words, we, we directly reach two main hubs that are related, that, that, that are involved in the Parkinson's related brain circuitry, thalamus plus cortex. I will give someone the prize for the funniest question of the night. Would it have any effect to hold a vibrating electric toothbrush? I'm, I'm joking, I'm not asking you to answer that. <laughs> no, but the most serious question actually uh, was about uh, the FDA approval. Um, now, is it too early to talk about that? Or, uh, you, of course, that would be a key step in your Th this would be marketing key step. of the product. Yeah, well, th this will be. I think I can I can provide you with more more realistic types of of, of timelines and reliable timelines um, early next year. Thank you very much. Now, a lot of our audience, roughly fifty percent, is based in the US, so we'll be very keen to see the product approved locally at some point. But uh, a lot of people also are based in the UK or in Europe and are just wondering whether you already are in touch with partners in those regions that would allow us to benefit from this globally. Well, fortunately, I was I was approached by people who are really world class in the medical device business. And their goal is really to bring it to patients. Of course, by means of an FDA approval study in the, FDA, uh, in the US, but also worldwide as quickly as possible. They are. That's it's not a US only type of uh, treatment. Perfect. Not. So, Peter, I've gone through the questions. I can't say that actually, out of the 65 questions, we have necessarily answered all, but I think we have answered a very high percentage because a lot of them were redundant. One question I didn't ask you, I think it's slightly unfair, but uh, it was asked by many people, so I will put it to you. Do you have an idea of your targeted price range for this product? I think it's probably very difficult, but actually, the question behind it is more will it be a product that will be within the reach, although maybe expensive, of Parkinson's patients, or would it be more meant to be used in clinical settings because they will be too expensive no. for the private individuals? No, 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 no. Uh, the, the good thing is, and that's why I'm also very confident, that's one aspect where I'm very confident to have the right partner now is the goal from the very beginning was to come up with something that's reimbursed and affordable. So in particular treatment for everybody, not just for the rich, so to speak. Thank you very much. Peter, I think that we have covered a lot of ground today. 
I would like to thank you not only for the time you made available today to talk to us, because I know you're under a lot of demands, and I'm pretty sure that actually focusing on the gloves is taking most of your energy and your time anyway. But thank yes. you very much for your generosity with your time, and thank you very much for focusing on something that is so critical for people who suffer from Parkinson's, like most of us are on the line today. So thank you yeah. ever so much. Yeah, thanks again, Michelle and Mark, for the invitation. It was a pleasure to be with you. Likewise, thank you so much. Good luck with the development of the new glove. Bye-bye. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.